Good morning. Been an interesting week, hasn't it? Actually, from here on out, until the Lord comes back, I think it's going to be extremely interesting. And uh, we as Christians need to uh, continue to do what God has called us to do. Would you agree? And not worry about what's happening. Would you agree to that? That's hard to do, Pastor. You know, uh, yeah, if you think you've you got something to do about it, technically you do. We're doing all that we can do and then stand. This morning, we're talking about the armor of God. I haven't preached on this in, in quite some time. And uh, there, there is so much to this. But this being uh, the week that we celebrate and, and, and uh, honor our veterans, which I am so grateful for. Guys, listen, I... I know that it doesn't look like it, but we true Americans, and understand what I'm saying, I'm being very quick, careful with my words and being very specific. We true Americans appreciate what you've done, the sacrifices that you've made. And I know Satan is going to do whatever he can to nullify that and make you feel like it was for naught. I'm telling you, it was for something. Thank you. Thank you. Because we do have a freedom of worshiping God still. Amen. And uh, you, you guys are inspiration to us. And when we say thank you for your service, we really mean it. Thank you. Because without you, we wouldn't have this country. All right. And, and we appreciate you. So this morning, we are on honoring the men and the women of the armed for arm forces who have given unselfishly of themselves to, to guarantee the freedom that we continue to have. Now, here's what I want you to understand about military people. I have noticed that they never quit, that they never give up. That they never walk away from what is right. This is a part of who they are. And it is an example of who we as Christians should be. Amen. Would you agree with that? Amen. We Christians are in a spiritual warfare. The devil would like to steal what he's given us. I want you to realize that he is a real enemy. He is the enemy we're fighting. It's not one another. It's a spiritual warfare. These spiritual enemies are out to destroy the testimony and the effectiveness of the believer. That's you. You can see it in your own life. You see it even if you're by yourself. Have you fought depression? Yeah, where does that come from? It's not from God. And when we get in heaven, we're not going to have that problem. Why? Because the enemy won't be there. But right now he's here and he's fighting us. And we as soldiers need to be able to fight back. Guys, we've got to prepare ourselves for the future, what's fixing to happen, right? I mean, if you're not ready for it, you know, it's, it's going to knock you down. You follow what I'm saying, right? Okay, uh, it, 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 it's like the catcher in, in a baseball game. He's sitting there. Can you imagine him without a mask? That first pitch that he misses is going to, boom, hit him right in the head, right? He should have prepared himself. Get a mask, right? Christians, that's what we need to do. Put a mask on. Prepare yourself for what's fixing to happen. And don't complain if you don't and you get hit in the head with a baseball. Duh. So this morning we're talking about the armor of God. Now I want you to realize that the enemy will seek to take you out and make you a prisoner. Two things. He wants to take you out. If he can't do that, he wants to make you a prisoner. And actually, if you want to go a step further, if he can't do that, he's going to try to negate you. He's going to try to control you with fear, right? Do we have the spirit of fear given to us by God? No. What do we have? Confidence in him, faith in him, right? He's going to take care of it. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We need to keep that in mind. 
1 Timothy 6 and 12, it says this, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Guys, you got people watching you. I got people watching me. We need to be the example. They need to see that there is hope because there's hope inside of us. God has given us that hope freely. We need to get that out. We need to express it. Part of our weapons before many witnesses is our testimony, our character, our love, and our caring compassion and honesty. That's what they look for. They're not seeing it in the world right now, especially in our government. Not all of our government, but in a lot of it. And it's getting worse and worse and worse, right? Why? Because it's the kingdom of darkness that's taking over, guys. All right? As Christians, we have to get ready for the warfare that's in front of us. Now, this is a positive statement, guys, because we win. And we've been given some incredible weapons. So many of us battle with depression, with finances, with circumstances, health issues, and life in general. Going into battle without any preparation or armor is not a good idea, and you will find it can be very painful. We've experienced that. So here is where we're going to be focusing on. This is Ephesians 6. 13 and 17, I'm going to keep coming back to this over and over and over again. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day. Follow what it's saying. And having done all to stand. Not get knocked down, but to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt with the truth, with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye all uh, uh, ye shall be able to quench the be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With this armor, you will never quit, never give up, never walk away from what is right, and you'll be able to stand your ground. Follow the examples of our veterans. Having done all the crises demands we are to resist the devil and all the evil that stands in our way so let's break this down at one time i think i broke this into six different sermons boy that's going to be a long day no guys i'm going to really condense it down but you really need to look at this Grab what God has given you. I, I, I have found that as, as, as we preach sermons, you know, I, I, I think, okay, this is for this person, and this is for this person, this is for this group of people, and for this group. And, and I find that I'm completely wrong because God's saying, listen, I gave you the sermon, and it's for each one of them. They're going to pick out what, what I've told them to pick out. They're following God's spirit. So here it comes. All right? It's going to come fast. So here we go. Let's start with truth. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, I want you to notice on the bottom, Amplified Translation puts this a little different. And I like how it says, it says, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins. Tighten it. So, here's the question. What is truth? Most think that truth is not telling a lie. But I believe that it is more than that. I believe it's seeking truth. It's putting aside anything that cannot be backed by truth. Pure truth is in Scripture. God's spoken 
It's, it's God's spoken word. The leading of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe the truth that Paul is talking about is what comes out of your mouth. I believe it's coming from your heart. In other words, our words is not whether you speak a lie or a truth, but what's, what's in here, what you believe, and why you believe it. We've got to tighten that up. Do you teach truth or do you teach what you've been taught or what you want to believe? Or what the Bible calls the teaching of man or the teaching of tradition? What is it? But Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is not in words, but in understanding. So we are told to tighten our understanding in God's truth. Does that make sense? To re-examine how we know and what we know to be the truth. To back that truth with study and scripture. That's tightening it up. To seek out more detail in that truth. Don't you just accept it? Search it out. Tighten it up. Now, keep in mind, if you lose your belt of truth, you lose all your weapons. And you kind of expose yourself to some things that you really don't want to get exposed. I'm going to say, you know. So, yeah, keep it tight. Tighten up your belt. The second thing it talks about is righteousness. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Isaiah says this. But we are all as unclean things. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. In other words, anything that you do is filthy rags. Well, wait a minute. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. You see, most Christians define righteousness as doing the right thing. Well, according to the scripture that's up there, that's filthy rags. Righteousness is not doing what you think is right. Because that is called filthy rags. Now, that's kind of confusing. How could scripture say this and yet says, put on righteousness if it's filthy rags we well, got to remember God's word blends together most Christians again think that doing righteousness is the right thing I feel right in what I do because I justify, justify it by the way I think you see that's filthy rags yeah, let me repeat that. I feel right in what I do because I justify by the way I think. That's filthy rags. Proverbs says this, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, well, Pastor, how do I put on righteousness then? If anything I do is filthy rags. You see, my own justice is what I call righteousness. I justify everything I do. <laughs> Nothing good inside of me. Luke 16, 15 says this, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourself before men. But God knoweth your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What? If our righteousness is filthy rags, then how do we put on righteousness? Good question. It is answered in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Well, what saith the, the scripture? Abraham believed God. 
Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, right living, right standing with God. In other words, we're talking about a real relationship between you and God. You want to put on righteousness, you do it the way Abraham did. He didn't have scripture. This was before Moses. He believed in God. He listened to God. He did what God said to do. And God says that was accounted to righteousness. It's not the way that you think. It's what he thinks and what he's telling you to do. And following after him is not being religious because that's filthy rags. But listening to the living God, the God that loves you, the one that wants to live inside of you, who cares for you, who died for you. He said, I've given you my spirit. I've given you wisdom. I've given you a path to follow. Trust me. Talk to me. And if I tell you to do something, you do that. That's righteousness. Does that make sense? Believing what God tells you to do is righteousness. Let's go to the next one. Preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, you guys know, we've talked about what peace is. The peace that the world has means no war, no fighting. But that's not what God's definition of peace is. His definition of peace is when your spirit agrees with his spirit. And there's no conflict and there's peace. When you have that, no matter what the world is doing around you, you have peace because you're talking to him. And he's leading and guiding you. I trust in that I have peace. In here, even though turmoil's going on all around me, I'm listening to him. Does that make sense? That is the gospel of peace, following after him and not a religion. Most Christians are prepared to discuss anything in the world but salvation. Ask them about healing, they can tell you about healing. Ask them about prophecy. They can tell you about prophecy. Ask them about spiritual warfare, and they can tell you about spiritual warfare. Ask them about prayer and praying and and, and the praying life, and they can tell you about your prayer closets and all that. Ask them about fasting, and they can tell you. But ask them about salvation, and most will change the subject. But I... But I asked them about salvation. They get scared. Uh, If I had someone come in and they just pointed to one of you and said, would you lead them to salvation? I would dare say most of you would say, uh, 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 right? Uh, 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 Pastor, that's your job. (laughs) I believe that people change the subject because they don't know about the subject of salvation. Because that's the one thing that Satan didn't want you to be able to express. We need to study salvation. It's ironic that that is the most important message that any Christian could give to anybody. So I want to help you out with this one. Actually, the best way to lead someone to to Christ is to do what we've been talking about already, and that's listening to God's Spirit. Because He'll tell you what to say, because He knows the heart of you and that person. And when you get to the point where you can listen to him, that's preparing yourself for the gospel of peace so that you can hear and say, God, what do I say? Nothing wrong with asking that. It's a good question. Because you've come up, I already know what I'm going to say. 
No. God, what do I say? So, let me help you out. This is what we used to call the, the Roman road. Uh, there, there are several scriptures in here. This is kind of my modified version of it. All right? And, and you should know these scriptures. At least understand what they say. It's not, maybe it's not a good thing just to quote them because a lot, of, a lot of new people don't even know what it means. But if you know what it means, you can say it in their own language. Here it is, right? John 3, 16. Good place to start, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How do you reward that? God loves you. He says, all you got to do is trust and believe in me. Look for him. He's already paid the price. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us have messed up, including me. You're not alone in this. Romans 6.23, for the wages is the sin of death, but the gift of God is life Eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In other words, we're paying the price for the way we live. We're already condemned. But God so loved you that he's paid the price for you. Romans 5 and 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No matter what position you're in, my friend, sin, whatever, God loves you and has already died for you. First John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In other words, it's a mulligan. You can start all over again. You need to understand these scriptures. It's not enough just to quote them because some of them, it's just a quote. But if you know them, if you've prepared yourself and it's in your heart, you'll find that God will lead you to these understandings and show you how to convert them to words that they can understand. We're not a religious people. We just serve a living God who's alive and wants to show himself to be alive. Ephesians 2 and 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It's a gift from God. In other words, there's nothing I can do to save me. There's nothing you can do to save you. You can't be good enough. The only way is him forgiving. And he's already done that. All you have to do is accept it. And let me get this last one in. John 6.44. No one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'll raise him up in the last day. You will find when you're talking to somebody, keep this in mind that God's working in here on them. <laughs> He's leading them. He's giving you the words to say because you've already prepared yourself for it. Not by memorizing scripture. Nothing wrong with that. But because you know that road and can talk to them about it. Let God lead you. That's what it means by preparing. Is this making sense? Let's go to the next one. The shield of faith. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked one. So here's the first question. What are fiery darts? They are devices used to discourage or control you. Who's throwing them? It's sure not God. It's not your neighbor. It's Satan. He's the enemy. You need to know Satan's devices. Amen. He knows what buttons to push to get you upset. Amen. 
doesn't he? Well, I thought my friend or my neighbor or my enemy knew those. You know, and it's Satan that does it, and he uses these other people to push your buttons. So what happens if he's pushing your button and nothing happens? His finger gets sore. I want a very sore finger on Satan. I want to get to the point where he can push that button all day long and he gets frustrated. Right? And how can you get to that point? By him pushing the button. There you go. Because each time he pushes the button and you go to God and say, God, I, I messed up. I got mad. I got bad again. And God will turn around and say, well, next time, Jerry, try this. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, and he pushes the button. You forget. And, and you say, God, why am I so mad? And he says, didn't I tell you? Yeah, I'll, I'll, get, I, I'll get it next time. Amen. Mm. Amen. Mm. And each time you get stronger And he gets stronger, and he gets stronger, and he gets to the point where he's going to wish he hadn't pushed your button. Because every time he does, you keep coming back stronger and stronger, more and more faith, more of learning, listening to him, and and being confident in what he's telling you to do, to realize that it's not the person, it's the demon that is using that person. Can, Can he use Christians? Oh, yes. Look at Peter. Poor guy. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Oh, yeah. Oh, be it far from you that you should. And he said, get behind me, Satan. He's talking to Peter. No, he's talking to the demon that was using Peter, one of his number one disciples. Guys, you've got to understand, he wasn't really talking to Peter. He was talking to the demon that was pushing the button. Because he thought he had a button. Christ says, you don't have a button. It ain't happening. Isn't that cool? So this is good stuff. Fear, intimidation, worry, circumstances, and impossible situations, just to name a few, are darts that he throws at you. <laughs> the Bible says that we should be dead to the world. Have you noticed that you can throw darts at a dead body all day long and it won't even flinch? <laughs> Amen. I want to be that way. Are you there yet? Not yet. I'm working on it. Probably won't be until Christ comes back. But yet I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Right? Why? Because he's throwing more darts. Come on, Satan. Come on. Right? Didn't it say that we should be suffering long? I don't like the word suffering. Wait a minute. (laughs) Denny right now, she's getting over heart surgery. She doesn't like the suffering she's going through right now because they make her get up and walk. She knows it's good for her. She still don't like it. I don't think I would either. You know what I'm saying? They're breathing things like this. But she's getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. She's walking further today than what she did yesterday. Right? It won't be long. She'll be back in here walking. Why? Because of the things she's going through right now. She's suffering, but that suffering's making her stronger. The same thing's true with us. We suffer long. But it's not for not, guys, and it's not to destroy us. It makes us stronger and stronger and stronger. Amen? Amen? Know the purpose of the darts is to neutralize you or to defeat you. Don't let them. So, what is a shield? It is something that renders darts useless. It is made of faith. It is not made of encouraging words. It is not made of mind over matter or of mental toughness. It's not made of that. It's made in trusting God and knowing that all things work together for your good. All things. And he'll never put more on you than what you can handle. I trust that. That means that everything that comes my way makes me stronger. I want to be strong. How about you? I want to be strong enough that when I go toe-to-toe with the devil, he goes, oh, man. Amen. I like what it was said about the guys that were trying to cast out these demons. And they said, we cast you out. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul talks about. And they said, we know who Jesus is, and we definitely know who Paul is, but who are you? 
I want them to know when I stand next to them. And they'll say, he, it's Jerry. Or, ooh, it's Scotty. Or, ooh, it's, it's Kathy. Or, it's, it's whoever. Amen. I, I fought them before. It hurt. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I intend to hurt them. How about you? But the only way I can do that is by getting strong with God. So your shield is your trust in God. Psalms 91, 2 and 7 says this. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wing you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, or you can call darts, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. Bottom line, faith is God's got your back. Trust him. We always think it's a shield coming up. No, it's just this. Throw it. Because God is my shield. And he's got my back. And I'm trusting him. I want to stand in him. Next one. Am I going too fast? Okay. The helmet of salvation. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. So what is the helmet of salvation and what does it do? Now, a helmet, if you think about it, is to protect what's inside of it, right? And if it's on your head, it's protecting your brain. And in a spiritual sense, it's protecting your thoughts. So how do you put on something that protects your heart? You see, in the spiritual world... A helmet is made out of some kind of metal or plastic, but not in the spiritual world. It's protecting your thoughts and protecting your soul, I would say. All right? Without a helmet, salvation helmet, your thoughts are unprotected. Now, wait a minute, I'm supposed to put this on. Is it a physical thing? No, it's a way of thinking. Second Corinthians, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through a mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We're talking about a battle, a battle that's happening right here. We need a helmet. Well, here it is. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's putting the helmet on. On. That means I'm protecting myself with God's word, with the thoughts that come into my head. I don't allow certain thoughts to stay there. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Philippians puts it this way. Finally, brethren, this is Philippians 4 and 8. Whatsoever things are true, think about it. This is the way that we bring everything into captivity, every thought. Think along these lines. Whatsoever is true. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. 
you line the thoughts up. These are the thoughts that you hang on to. You capture the others and throw them out. That's the helmet of salvation. That's how you think. Oh, wait a minute. Man, I, 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 I don't have enough money to pay my bills next week or the week after that. Uh, uh, God, are you really there? Yeah, if you had those thoughts. Uh, I don't know if I can trust you. I'm trying to, God, whatever. No, 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 wait a minute. Capture that thought. Because my Bible says, I will supply all your needs. All you have to do is ask. Trust me. Is there virtue in that? Yes. Is there virtue in the other? No. Don't think those thoughts. Put on the helmet of salvation. I'm going to capture the bad stuff, throw them out, and follow what God's word says. Because when I do that, they come in to hear. And here's where faith is, isn't it? So that when you speak, what comes out of your mouth is faith. Why? Because that's all you're allowing in. The Bible puts it another way. If your eyes are on the light, then your body is full of light. But if you start looking at darkness and how great is that darkness. Guys, I don't want to look at darkness. Amen. Now, I'm going to be realistic. Yeah, I got bills to pay tomorrow. Okay, God, show me what I need to do. You see what I'm saying? Oh, or I'm saying, God, don't you care? Amen. Wrong thought. Because he does. It says he does. And there's no virtue in that. But God, you said that. All I have to do is ask, and I'm going to trust you. Well, well, pastor, I've done that before, and the bills weren't paid. Been there. Kathy and I have been there. We've talked about that. There were months. It didn't look like it was happening. But I can turn around and tell you why. Because all things work together for the good. Amen. Kathy and I know what it's like. Not to have the money to pay the bills, to have... The deputy sheriff at the front door saying, you owe this. <laughs> yes, sir, I do. God, don't you care? And that was the wrong thing to say. What I should have said, God, I'm trusting you. Because within two months, and I can't tell you how, because I don't know how even to this day things turned. And all of a sudden we had the money to pay. And it kept coming in from different places. Although it looked like it didn't work. Satan kept pushing the buttons and it finally got to the point. You know, it's, it's funny. Sometimes you've got to get knocked all the way to the ground before you look up to where your salvation is. Some of us are that dumb. Notice I said us. Including myself. There's been many times I got knocked down. Kept thinking, I want to do it this way, I want to do it this way. I need to get that job, I want to do this and everything else. Nothing wrong with that looking and seeking and knocking on doors. Nothing wrong with that. But it can't control your life. Amen. You've got to get to the point where you trust him. And when you start seeing him doing the miracles, like I'm just talking about, you look and go, there was only one way that could happen, and that's him. Amen. And that's him. And that's trusting him. You know, faith is not doing what you're comfortable with doing. Faith is stepping outside of that box. Because there's where faith is. If you can see how you can do it, that's nothing. But when you get to the point where God, you say, God, I don't see how I can do this. He says, I told you, don't lean to your own understanding. Trust me. Amen. You might be in a boat. The storm's going, the water's coming over the sides. And do like the disciples. God, don't you care? <laughs> it should have been, uh, Lord, we got a problem up here. Would you take care of this? Amen. That's the attitude. He would have got up and said, oh, no problem. Peace be still. <laughs> Instead, wrong attitude. They learned. Isn't that good? We're learning. God understands that. But we need to keep learning. Have I said enough on that one? Think on these things. 
The sword of the Spirit. You guys know what the sword of the Spirit. It is the Word. The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So if you didn't know, you should have read the scripture. You would have had the answer. I love tests like that. Don't get them often. So, the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12. This is the Amplified Version. For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, uh, operative, energizing and effective it is sharper than any two-edged sword penetrating and to the dividing line of the breath of life which is your soul and the immortal spirit of joints and mar marrow marrow of the deepest parts of your our nature exposing and shifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purpose of the heart. Now, it says that it is a two-edged sword, right? So what does that mean? It means it cuts both ways, guys. Scripture says that if you condemn others for stealing, do you steal? That's God's word. It's two-edged. You better be careful because you can cut yourself pretty good with it. Back in the days, I was a technician. There are, uh, they call them electrician snips. They look like scissors, but they're not scissors. Man, these things are sharp. They'll cut through metal. Uh, if, you, if you get with AT&T or, or these workers, uh, they've got them. They, they carry them around, look like scissors or not. The thing is that when I would buy a new pair, my hands would be a bloody mess because they were so sharp. Because I'd be cutting something like this and everything, and I'd look and I'd go, oh, man, I cut myself. You see, well, that's God's word. you got to be careful. Scripture says, if you condemn others for stealing, do you steal? Scripture says, judge not, lest you shall be judged. The speck in your brother's eye, the beam in your eye. You see, it's a two-edged sword. If we judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. In other words, you better be careful which way that thing's coming before you start swinging it that way. Does that make sense? All Scripture, this is in 2 Timothy 3 and 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Guys, that's cutting both ways, including here. And a lot of times we need to get cut. Because if we don't get cut, we wouldn't know God can heal. Does that make sense? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. I want to throw some things at you real quick. Because the Word of God is this. It is written. 63 times in the New Testament it says it is written. I'm not going to go all of them. But I'm going to hit the main ones. It is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The word of God, it cuts both ways. It is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. It is written, the just shall live by faith. It is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. It is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It is written, I have lived, save, I, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. It is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. It is written, 
He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. It is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. It is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. This is the word of God. It cuts both ways. So with this, we covered the whole thing. I want to read it one more time. Hopefully, it sounds different to you now that you understand the actual meaning of this scripture. Ephesians 6, 13 through 17, King James. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. That's where we're at. Having done all to stand, you do all these things. You prepare yourself. If you're in a baseball catcher, you better put a mask on. It's a good idea to have a glove, too. And all the other stuff that's on there. Right? You understand? Okay. Stand, therefore, having your loins gird about with proof. Tighten it up. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Do what he's telling you to do. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Know what that means and how to tell other people about it. Right? Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hopefully, the next time you read that, this comes alive. I would suggest read it. Break it down just like I did. Look at it. Let God talk to you. Let Him enrich your understanding. You see what I'm saying? Because He just doesn't reserve that for pastors. It's for all of us, His children. All we have to do is say, God, give me wisdom. He says that you, you ask it. He goes a step further than that. Even if you're a sinner, he says he does. He gives you wisdom without prejudice. He doesn't care if you ask him. He's going to give it to you. There you go. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be open. Amen. Is this good? We are soldiers. We honor the soldiers that defend this nation. We should also honor the soldiers that you and me that defend the faith. Amen. Isn't it good that God uses us? I am so thankful that he's using us. Let us have the fun instead of the angels. Right? Get fun? <laughs> yeah, it is fun. Is it hard? Yeah, it is hard. Right? But it's still fun, right? Okay. Uh, I'll stop with that. Those of you that are on Facebook, may God bless you. Have a good day. I hope this opens your eyes to a lot of things that God wants us to know. He is not a religion. He is a God that loves you, creator of the universe, God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, my heavenly Father who is in heaven. And he loves me. And he loves you. And he wants one thing, reconciliation. He wants to have a relationship with you. You have to make that decision. Amen. God bless you on Facebook. Have a great day.